just wanted to get things started. Thanks to everyone who's um, joined us so far this evening. Thanks very much for um, being a part of our meetup. Um, this is our first um, lightning talk um, within our series of .NET meetups. So as m most of you probably know, we're gonna be hearing from uh, Robin, Stuart and Joe tonight. Just a bit of background on IO Associates before that. Michael and myself both work for Bio Associates. Um, we're a specialist recruitment firm. And if you may have seen us or, or had emails from us before, um, we are both, Michael and myself, specialised in .NET, um, myself on the contract side and Michael on the permanent side. And um, as an organisation, we're also heavily involved in Reading and London .NET, which we organise, and also um, help out with the, the Bristol and, uh, and Cheltenham and, um, and Wales event. Um, before we move on tonight, just wanted to say, with the market is, is obviously very kind of fluctuating a lot at the moment. Um, if anyone is looking for a job themselves at the moment or wants any advice on the market or their CV or how to help with applications, please feel free to, to reach out to myself or, or Michael. Um, and on top of that, if you're um, in a position where you, you are looking to grow your team at the moment, um, we'd, we'd love to help you out with that as well. So do feel free to reach out. Um, but besides that, we will move on with our evening. Um, and I'll pass you on to Michael, who's going to introduce Robin. Thank you. Thanks, Stella. Um, That's all right. Yeah, of course, I'll be, I'll be very, very, very quick on this. So, yeah, I just want to introduce Robin, who's going to be doing a talk on a, a WASP HUD WTF. Um, so, um, yeah, thank you very much for, to Robin, Stuart and, um, and Joe this evening uh, for sort of getting involved with the Lightning Talks. Um, without further ado, I will um, stop sharing my face and I will put you on to, uh, to Robin. Oh, cheers. Thank you very much. Um, what, what we'll do with we, yeah, I'm sorry, I was going to say there is a question box as well, so feel free um, to um, submit your questions throughout, which Robin, uh, Stuart and Joe can see, and we'll also, at the end of it, we'll do a Q&A, uh, if there's still questions at the end of the free talks, we can do a bit of a sort of a panel Q&A as well uh, with everyone. Cool. Cheers. I will um, mute myself as well now. Um, and yes, yeah, Stuart, yeah, cool, perfect. Cheers, Robin. Thanks, mate. Just be great. Thank you, everybody. Um, evening, everybody. Um, well, this is strange, isn't it? The uh, last time I gave this talk um, was at an actual conference, um, NDC London in January. Um, but it's really interesting to be doing this um, here now um, in these peculiar times. Um, so my name is Robin Minto. I work for a company called Buybox. Um, we're a supply chain management technology company in the UK. Um, and I want to spend a bit of time talking about how we can take a small but important step in improving our web application security um, using the OWASP SAP HUD. Uh, so I need to show you this screen too. Hopefully you can see that. Okay. So um, the first thing I, I think we're going to do is start with a, a little poll through uh, through WebEx. Um, Michelle, do you want to start with the first question? Okay. So uh, I, I, I kind of want to get an idea of um, you know people's uh, understanding of, of some of these things already, um, and this will help with that. Part one, question one. Is, have you heard of OWASP? Lots of answers coming in. Cool. So, um, so it looks like most of you have heard of OWASP. Um, a few of a few are very familiar with it, and um, a couple. Not familiar. Well, we'll talk a little bit about what it is in a second. Um, the next question in the poll. Okay, so that's very cool. Um, lots of people have never heard of Zap, which is uh, really, really interesting because uh, hopefully, yeah, uh, this will be interesting for people. Um, 
Cool. So let's talk a bit about this jumble of letters. Um, so OWASP is the uh, Open Web Application Security Project. Um, it's a charity worldwide, uh, local groups, local user groups all over the world, um, and members create projects, articles, documentation, standards for web security, um, and tools like, like Zap. And Zap is the Z attack proxy. Um, it's one of the flagship projects. It's a scanner and intercepting proxy for security testing. Um, so it allows you to catch security issues in your code as you're developing uh, part of your build pipeline, perhaps, or for penetration testing. Um, it's free, open source, um, cross-platform, written in Java, um, runs locally, and actively developed um, and downloaded by um, millions of people. The HUD is a new feature of Zap um, last year, I think. Um, head up display now I guess people are probably familiar with these even if you didn't know what they were called you see them in aircraft very commonly um, not sure how many pilots we've got in uh, cars are getting them now um, and you you know you see them in computer games things like halo um, but it's basically presenting information in your field of vision I think you probably know this one so why do we care about security? Uh, well, it's really generally all about money. Um, it's the you know the cost of cleaning up a breach, reputation damage, might be um, direct theft or blackmail, uh, might be fines from things like GDPR. Um, you don't want to end up on Troy Hunt's website. Again, that's reputation damage. And another thing I like to talk about is pushing left or shifting left. Um, so uh, this is this is talked about not just in security but um, you know, in sort of quality in general. Um, and why why do we want to push left? Well, uh, you know, here's a here's a graph which illustrates your development pipeline and the cost of fixing defects in your code effectively over time. So as you um, build your software and deploy it and operate it, um, the cost of fixing problems goes up. And this is fairly well known. Applies to any kind of software bug, including security. So really we wanna push all of our quality testing uh, early on in the pipeline. We wanna do it early, um, keep the cost down, find those problems um, before they cost us money from a development perspective, but also from a you know, fines and, and all those kind of issues perspective later as well. So I talked a bit about the fact that um, Zap works as a scanner. Um, so an, an intercepting proxy as well. I want to talk a bit about what that means. So you've got your web application, you've got your uh, Zap proxy running on your machine, and you basically, you can point it at your website and it will scan spidering your application, um, sort of same way Google does. Um, or you can use it in a slightly different mode, in a proxy mode. Um, and this is helpful for teaching Zap about your application. So you basically take your web browser and you explore your application, but all of your traffic is proxied through Zap. So Zap gets an opportunity to understand the structure of your application and gets a chance to look at the requests and the responses and see if there's any uh, issues with them. And it can passively look for those kind of problems. Um, it can also do a bit more than that, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. So how do you get started with Zap? Well, you can go to zoproxy.org, um, just hit the download button, download it from there. Or if you might like me, you might uh, use a package manager like Chocolatey or perhaps Homebrew on the Mac. Um, you can run it in a Docker container too, which is pretty cool. Um, all of the links to these things are on my blog. That's robinminto.com slash talk slash zaphud. Um, but let's have a look at a demo. So this is um, Bob's Discount Diamonds. Um, Bob is my father-in-law. Um, this is a website I built for him. No, I didn't. No, this is a, a website I'd built 
deliberately to be insecure, full of interesting vulnerabilities that tools like Zap should hopefully find. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's probably all I need to say about that for a second. Um, this is Zap. So this is running on my machine. Um, now, obviously, there's quite a lot going on in this UI. Um, so I'm not going to go into all of that. But what I will do is point, point out this bit. So you could kick off an automated scan. Um, you could look at this, the sites in your searching and some detail comes out down here. But what I'm going to do is go for a quick start, manual explore. I've got the URL I'm interested in um, lined up already. Uh, I've got the HUD enabled. I'm going to launch the browser, in this case, Firefox. Um, that's going to pop up on the wrong screen. So I'm going to drag that across. So basically, this has now enabled the HUD. You'll see some issues have come up already down here. Um, and it's also added bars down the left and right and something at the bottom. So we've got history down here and some uh, little tabs left and right. And that is the HUD. So basically, um, Zap is um, adding HTML into my web app um, to, to enable these, these uh, buttons um, and basically give me information in the field of view as I'm looking at the, at the website. So the first thing I'm going to do is tell um, Zap that this website is in scope. So basically adding the current domain to scope. Great. OK. Um, so what can I do with Zap? So, I mean, typically what you do is you just kind of explore your application. I can send send a message here. I can go and look at some things. And all the time Zap is uh, analyzing the website, looking at how it's built. Uh, search for same thing, yeah, etc. So Zap is kind of understanding how my web app is constructed. Um, and you can see that it sort of understands a bit about how things look. I can see the requests and responses that it's seen. I could modify them. I'll do that in a second. Um, so I could enable break mode. So in this case, I'm just going to type hello. If I send that, it intercepts the request. And now I've got a chance to go in and modify that request. So now I get a slightly different response there back from the web server. Um, so I've, I could have changed headers, I could you know, change the body, et cetera. Um, all sorts of things, interesting things to do there. Um, one thing I can also do from here is I can kick off a spider. So I said that oh, well, the Zap can scan your website. So I could actually kick that off from here. So as well as exploring it manually, I could do a spider as well. It's pretty quick because it's, uh, it's a fairly small website. It's found a, an issue there already. Oh, there's some more. Um, and once, I, once Zap has got a good idea of how your website is structured, either by spidering or by you exploring, you can, you can do an active scan. And, it's, and whereas it's been doing passive scanning so far, this will actually send re requests to your web app and it will modify parameters and tweak things, just trying to figure out um, if you've got issues. So I can kick that off now. Um, and any alerts will pop up down at the bottom and it will be indicated on the on the sidebar. So site alerts over here, page alerts over here. So I could go in and see that as, as this is going through, you know, I've still got some high alerts. Got, I've got cross-site cross scripting attack. It's just found a SQL injection attack. Um, so I could go into this page. And see that there's a cross-site scripting attack. Gives me some information about about that attack. Um, tells me how it exploited it, and gives me some information about how I fix it. So that's going through, and that's that's now finished. So I've got a SQL injection attack on the search page. Again, that's how it's exploited. I can also go in and uh, do some other things. So um, let me look at, uh, oh yeah, comments, okay. Um, you can show comments in the website. 
Um, so for example, you know, you can see there's various things up here. Oh, uh, look, it looks like we might have a, an issue here that we could try and exploit. You know, th things that are hidden in plain sight that you can expose. Similarly, you could also enable hidden fields. So in this case, I might, you know, might go in and say, let's make that, uh, let's make that admin, see what happens, you know, exp explore things. Um, and once you're done with all this, then you can have a, a complete report of what uh, Zappers discovered in your app, which you can then share with people um, or use as part of your triage process. So that is um, a pretty whirlwind tour of um, the Zap HUD. Um, there's a tutorial built into uh, the HUD, so I could I could re-enable that um, or start it from here. Um, you've got basically a, a walkthrough of all all of the features of the HUD, which is really quite good to get going. Um, the series of 10-minute training videos on the um, on the Zap website as well. Uh, again, that's really good. Um, as I mentioned, all of the resources are on my blog at robinminto.com slash talk slash Zap HUD. Um, so download Zap, give it, give the HUD a go, take a look at the resources from OWASP, um, make sure you're testing early on, um, let me know how you get on and um, enjoy the other talks tonight. Now I think we've got uh, a couple of minutes for questions before we move on. So I just look um, at... So yeah, Robin, I had a, we've had one question come through. I just said, is it possible to run Zap against protected resource where the end user must authenticate? Yeah. Yes, it is. So you would basically teach um, Zap how to uh, authenticate. So you give it credentials. So um, that might be that you give it... Um, you, you, you teach it how to look, authenticate and get a cookie or a token, um, or you just generate the token and give it to Zap to and do it that way. But yeah, you, you can do that, absolutely. Um, there's another question, isn't there? Yeah, so um, so that question was from Dean Bob. Also, Julian Berry has asked, um, is Zap programmable, Zap scriptable such that it can be baked into pipelines or spec flow tests? Yeah, so there is, um, there's an API so you can automate Zap. Um, the other thing you can do, as I say, you, you can run it in a Docker container. Um, and what typically what you might do with that is run um, what's called a baseline scan, where it, it basically does um, a certain amount of spidering and, and scanning um, to um, uh, to figure out, you know, if there are particular issues with your app. Um, I don't know if you noticed, not that one. Uh, in the quick start, they do mention that you can run a Zap baseline scan as a GitHub action now. So that's just been added yeah. to GitHub actions. Um, so yeah, it's 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 definitely automatable. Cool. Um, and Duskin Gorski has asked, what sort of security issues has has it discovered during your development, and what's the rate of false positives from your experience? Um, my experience is that it's kind of on par with other tools. Um, I don't have a particular number, um, but I think with all of these things, particularly the you know the automated stuff, you you always have to triage the the issues and and just decide you know what's your risk profile and what um, what you feel about the particular issues that that it's raising. Um, you know, it's never going to be as good as a as a, a human person doing it, um, but it's a, a really good way of um getting certainly dealing with that low hanging fruit particularly you know early on in your development life cycle cool and um mark goss has asked can you test apis with zap you can um i think that if i go into here um you can probably use something like the ajax spider um but yeah you can absolutely test apis with it cool and then i think we'll do one more question before um move on the stupid if anyone's got any other questions um i know robin's gonna be happy to answer them in the end but um richard howes has asked um did i get this correct zap runs local to the browser even if the site is on another machine so zap um as i'm running it now i'm running it 
it on my local machine and it is injecting HTML into my browser uh, for the HUD. So SAP runs as, as, as a Java application on my local machine and I'm proxying my website, my browser through Zap and it is adding the HUD as HTML into the code that gets rendered by the browser. Um, so my website is, is actually on the same machine as well, but that website could be somewhere completely different. It would, it would do exactly the same thing. Um, I hope hopefully it answers the question. And um, sorry, I can just see one, one last one. Um, is it a follow up from Julian Berry? So does it play nice with other proxy software like Fiddler? So um, you will have to choose which proxy you're using. I don't think you, I mean, you could probably chain them, um, but I've never tried that. Um, you know, you've, you're probably getting the information that you would get from Fiddler in, in Zap. So you're seeing all the same information and you can modify things sim in a similar way in either. Um, I, I, I expect you could chain them, but who knows what would happen if that if you did that. But you can certainly switch from one to the other. Um, and the way I'm using it here where I launch the browser from Zap, it wires up just that browser instance um, with the proxy so it doesn't interfere with anything else you're doing. Um, hopefully that helps. Cool. All right. Perfect. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much, Robin. Um, really appreciate that. Um, if anyone's got any other questions, we can sort of run through them at the end. Um, but, yeah, we will now move on to Stuart. So, yeah, I know if everyone would be normally clapping, so I'll do a little bit more for everyone else. <laughs> but, um, very kind. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. Cheers, mate. Cool. And then if um, Stuart wants to. Uh, yeah, let me just share my screen. Bear with me. Uh, cool. Has it got the right screen? Yes, that looks yeah. good. Cool. So yeah, thank you very much again, Robin. Um, now we'll move on to Stuart with his um, talk on uh, C Sharp A async streams and uh, channels. So I'll drop off and meet myself. But and then I think the same again. If anyone's got any questions, um, just I think uh, Stuart, you can see the question box, so you can answer them as you go. If not, we can sort of uh, answer them at the end. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'll take them at the end. And we'll see how we go. All right. Cool. Yep. Cheers. Yep. Uh, thanks, Robin. Uh, really, really good talk. Um, apologies for the camera. I'm having camera issues here, so just bear with me. Um, so, yeah, uh, today I'll be talking about um, C Sharp A, in particular async streams and channels, which is a bit related. Um, there's been a good few talks about C Sharp 8, but uh, they tend to focus on some of the, the bigger features like uh, novel reference types. This is this is certainly a less, uh, lesser known feature. So. Uh, we'll take a look at that. Um, so just a little about me. I'm I'm Stu. Um, I blog at stu.dev. Um, I'm a developer, a Microsoft MVP, and love everything.net. So I'm a big fanboy of F Sharp for those that know those that know me. Um, but I also love C Sharp and some of the new features that are coming out. Um, you can uh, follow me on Twitter if you want, but uh, my DMs are open, so you don't have to. Um, so to kind of explain um, async streams. Um, it's good to understand the problem that it solves. So um, here's, here's, here's a problem, for example, um, that I think we faced historically in C-sharp. Um, so here's a real API, it's the Zendesk API. And um, it's a paged API, so when we call it, we get back um, a, a payload of like 20 results for the users. And it also has a, a nullable property that we might get back for the next page that will have another 20 users. And if, we, if we're being responsible .NET devs, we want to await this um, await that request. Um, but if we're doing that in what is now kind of a loop, uh, there's been no nice way of kind of exposing that in the type system. So in this example here, we're kind of, we've just newed up a list and we're we're going to loop until we've got all the results and we're then populating that list. And now we've lost the lazy nature of this paging API, which, which may be no good for us. It may be that um, this API, you know, pages forever and uh, and we can't have it all in memory. So historically, this has been a problem, and there's been ways of solving it. But really, the thing we've wanted is async enumerable um, and async streams, and that's what's um, been available now with uh, with C# Sharp 8 and .NET Core 3. Um, and it gives us this familiar definition. So this is this is the grammar of um, a stream, um, and it's the same grammar as I enumerable, uh, and that is its uh, next star, which means zero, one, or many next items, 
and then at the end there bracket question mark which is like optionally um, either an error or completed um, so for example we may get no items uh, and an error and that's a valid stream um, and that familiar definition means that we can have a familiar language on top of it so uh, we know that to be link so um, we can have you know where select and all the rest of it um, anything that follows this uh, this this grammar we can have you know link apis on top of uh, and then to put it in context with the other types that exist um, there's the the ubiquitous uh, iron in rule of t which is synchronous and pool based uh, and we've also got in rx um, i observable which is push based and just to kind of put this in context i is is asynchronous and pool based uh, and here's here's how it works this is uh, i async enumerable and basically it's exactly the same as i enumerable the only difference is on the on the move next method rather than returning a boolean uh, it now returns a value to ask a boolean uh, so it's now asynchronous so it's very familiar to us uh, and i'm going to take a look at it so i'm going to do a code demo now hopefully this all works but uh, let me know if it doesn't uh, switching over to Rider, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Let me know if the font isn't big enough and I'll I'll tweak the font. Um, so uh, this is a console application and I've got the uh, AWS SDK in here, the, um, the SQS SDK. And this is something you might do. You might, um, if you're dealing with like uh, message queues, whether it be AWS SQS or um, Azure Service Bus or, or, or Rabbit MQ or whatever, you might have a little console application that uh, in a tight loop will await some messages off of a queue uh, and then process those messages. So here we have got our message. We might, you know, handle it somehow. And this is a really nice candidate for turning into an async stream because it kind of turns it inside out and we can then layer on things on top of it. For example, um, throttling, buffering, uh, we can project the messages into a different format and so that's what we're going to do here so we can extract this into a local function uh, we're going to call this uh, get messages async and historically in c sharp we've been able to yield yield return in iterator methods when we're returning an i enumerable um, and we've been able to um, await in async methods, but we've never been able to mix the two, in spite of the fact that, um, in terms of uh, in terms of the compiler feature, it's kind of the same compiler gymnastics. Um, so it's kind of the same feature, right? So it's odd that we've never been able to mix the two of them. Um, but now in C sharp eight, you can. So if we do this, Rider will offer to if we yield return the message now. Rider's offered to uh, change the signature to I async enumerable, and over here where we called it, we can now just get the messages here. Um, and so we need to be able to consume these messages now. And there's a couple of ways of doing it. Um, you can use the language level feature. Um, so writer has got a really handy um, helper where you can do dot for each and tab and it will just do the right thing. Um, and so it's like a regular for each loop, except you've got the await keyword in front of it. And that that's what makes it, um, enumerate it, you know, asynchronously. Um, so that's one way of handling it. But um, as I mentioned earlier, another nice way of handling all this is to um, is to use link. So um, here's a sample I made earlier, Blue Peter style. Um, and I'm just going to jump over to the project file. So to use um, link methods, um, if you just try and do it out of the box um, with .NET Core 3.1 or whatever. Uh, you'll find you won't have things like select and where. Um, if you pull in system.interactive.async, which comes from the um, the Rx repo uh, from Microsoft, this has got all the the things uh, methods you might expect. Um, and this targets not just uh, .NET Core, um, but also targets Net Standard 2 and I think full framework as well. So you can expose async streams and have it be consumed by um, older targets and, and .NET framework that don't support, you know, at the language level, uh, async streams. So that's handy. And it gives you things like where select um, and for each async. And uh, so I should just point out just in case, because uh, this will catch you out if you use this. 
um, there's where uh, and select and the rest of it. And there's also where await and select await. Um, and that's because um, sometimes you want to be doing async stuff inside of these delegates. Um, and where and select take synchronous delegates. Um, so there has to be uh, separate extension methods for those. So for example, here, where it says for each await async, if I took that await word out, this wouldn't do what we expect because if I mouse over it there, that um, that action is synchronous, but we, we're returning a task here, so it wouldn't behave as we expect it. Uh, so just watch out for that. Um, so let me take this back out. I want to quickly show, which I'll keep that in. Um, I'm going to quickly show how cancellation tokens work because that's also interesting. Default. Someone asked what font I'm using. I think this is uh, Thera Code, um, uh, but I haven't got the ligatures on actually. So uh, yeah. Um, so here I've got a cancellation token, and I'm going to pass it in. I'm going to add the cancellation token parameter. Um, I'm going to make it optional because that's what we do. And we're going to throw if the cancellation has been requested in a couple of places. And we're also going to flow the cancellation token into any async methods that, that want it. Uh, so now this method's cancelable. Uh, and you can see we're passing in just the dummy cancellation token here. Um, and you can see down here, um, Rider's got a green squiggly here and it wants us to do something. If we have a look, it wants us to pass the cancellation token. So on these methods that kind of terminate the sequence, like count async or for each async or for each await async, they take a cancellation token um, that will be flowed all the way through this um, these uh, link chain methods. Um, but this won't actually work at the moment. Um, and I'll also show how we do it for when we for each it here. If I say for each, to pass the cancellation token when we're for reaching over it asynchronously, there's an extension method. And again, I'll let Ryder do the hard work for me. Um, there's an extension method called with cancellation, and that's how you do it there. And this won't actually work at the moment. And the reason for that is that um, when we use with cancellation here, we're doing it on the enumerator. And so the compiler needs to know how to pass the cancellation token into the um, into this um, enumerator method. So at the moment, we've got this cancellation token. And the compiler doesn't know that this is a special parameter, so we need to tell it somehow. Um, and we do that by adding an attribute. Now, in like .NET Core today, um, the, the version of C# -sharp that ships, um, you can't do this in a local function. So I'm going to convert it to a, a regular method. Um, but in the version that's going to ship with um, .NET 5, and it works with Preview 5 at the moment, um, you can do this in a local function. So this is just a temporary thing right now. So I'm converting this to a regular method. And you can see that Rider wants me to do something here. It wants me to add, put this on new line, an enumerator cancellation attribute. And this tells the compiler that this is the parameter to use when passing a cancellation token into the enumerator. So now this cancellation token will do its job. And you may be wondering why, why can I pass the token here and here? Um, that doesn't make much sense. Um, you can do that because you may not be the one creating the async enumerable. It may be somebody else. You may be just operating on it, in which case you'll still want the ability to be able to cancel that enumeration. Um, so what happens is that this method doesn't actually get run until um, it's, it's lazy. So it doesn't get run at all until it's enumerated. So only when we hit this um, curly brace here do we actually then enter this method, this curly brace here. Um, at that, and at that point, um, the cancellation token that enters it will will be either the one you passed in at the point you invoke the method, um, or it will be the, the one that you pass in with this extension method. Um, and if you pass two separate ones in, the compiler 
um, the compiler generated code will actually combine them together to make a linked token source and use that token. So under the hood, it kind of just does the right thing. Um, and you can pass the token here, you can pass it there. If you pass both, um, it's actually just going to pick one of them because they're the same. Um, so that just works. It's kind of cool. Uh, so let me undo that cancellation token stuff because it's just going to make the next demo a little bit noisy. Do, 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 do. So we're back as we were. Uh, and now I want to talk about channels. So for those of you who aren't familiar with channels, um, it's kind of, uh, it's a way of uh, building um, producer consumer patterns. So, um, and, it, and it's async. So um, for those of you who've used um, blocking collection, um, this is like that, but without the blocking bit, right? So let's build a channel here. So say var channel equals, um, and you can create a bounded channel or an unbounded channel. Um, you can do this, I think it's .NET 2.2, um, .NET Core, sorry, 2.2, when they introduced this API. So you can use it, um, you can use it prior to um, C Sharp 8. Um, so when you create the channel, you have to pick bounded or unbounded. You'll probably want to pick bounded because um, you, you're going to want to think about back pressure. And in our case here, where we've got um, message queues, we certainly want the back pressure in those message queues. Um, so we can create a bounded channel. Think of it as a collection. So we have to give it a, a, a type of the thing that we're putting in and out of it. Um, so in this case, message. And you can give it a capacity. In the bounded one, you have to give it a capacity. Uh, so we're going to give it 10 just arbitrarily. Um, you can also use the, there's an options um, constructor. And this gives you a few other bits and bobs to tweak. For example, um, if you know you're not going to be writing or reading concurrently, um, the implementation can uh, skip some of the, the the correctness checks it would do and the uh, the synchronization checks it would do. Uh, so you can have it a bit more efficient. So in this case, I know that I'm only going to be writing to it uh, non-concurrently. So I'm going to say single writer true. And if we look at the channel for a minute, we've got two properties. We've got reader and writer. It's as simple as that. Um, and so our producer is going to be writing stuff using that writer and our consumer is going to be reading stuff using the reader. So if we pass that channel dot writer into this method now and I add that parameter then what we're going to do is rather than yield returning messages out we're turning this um, asynchronous um, method into this um, async stream method we're going to turn it into something that writes into this channel so I'm going to do um, write async and write the message in and we await this thing um, and if we just look at the channel writer for a second we've got a few things we can do we can complete it um, and we can complete it option with an exception and I'll do that in a minute um, we can try complete it so if I'm writing to the thing concurrently I may not know that I'm the only person trying to complete it in which case I may not want an exception to happen if I've already, if I complete it where someone else has already completed it, um, we've got write async. That's where I uh, I write an item, I put an item into the channel. If the channel is full, I would then wait until it's not full. If it's an unbounded channel, I know that it can never be full. Um, so there's also these um, this pair of methods: try write and wait to write async that are kind of useful. So try write will synchronously return guaranteed. Um, and it was returned true or false uh, to tell you if it succeeded. So in the unbounded channel case, you can use try write because you know it's always going to succeed. Um, with, whereas with the bounded one, you can do try write, and if it returns false, then you know it was full, and then you might have to call wait to write async and await that thing. Um, so if you're super, you know, aggressive on performance, you may want to use those two methods together uh, to kind of opportunistically write synchronously. But when you need to wait, then await it. But here we don't need that uh, that level of fanciness. Uh, I'm going to wrap this whole thing in a 
try catch. And do channel writer dot complete. And so if there's any exceptions, I'm gonna call complete with that so that the reader can can get that and see what's going on. Uh, so now this method is no longer returning an async enumerable message. It's just async, not returning anything, so it's a task. And on this uh, calling side here, um, if I were to wait this, we'd be waiting forever. So we don't want to do that. Um, so you can put it into, you can have the task put into a variable somewhere, uh, in a field somewhere. And in my case, I, I just don't care about it for this demo. So I'm just going to discard it with a C sharp discard. And now I can then consume the messages using that channel, using the reader. So if I have a look at reader here for a second, we have a completed property, a completion property. That's the task we can await to get, you know, to wait for it to complete. Uh, we might get an exception there if if, uh, if complete completed with an exception. Uh, you can read async, and this is like write async. It's just taking one value, um, one item out of the collection or the channel. Um, and if the collection is empty, then it will wait as you expect it to. Um, and again, there's this pair of methods that are nice to use together, which is try read. Um, and in the case where it's empty, it will return false. And there's wait to read, where you can await and do that. Uh, but there's also this really nice uh, method on it called read all async. And if we use that, let me get rid of this code. It returns us an I async enumerable, which we we had before, right? So we can kind of easily go from a channel writer straight to a I async enumerable and use all that good um, link stuff and language level cool stuff on top of it. And if we have a little look at the implementation of read all async, uh, you'll see it does that more high performance uh, trick that I, I mentioned, which is it waits to read, and then it kind of opportunistically, cheekily tries to read them all synchronously until it can't, and then it waits again. Um, so that's kind of nice. And then, yeah, with these uh, messages here, we might do something, I don't know, like this, um, where we spin up a number of tasks um, that are all going to concurrently get their own iAsync enumerable of messages and process them. Uh, so we can kind of have multiple uh, with channels, you can have multiple producers, multiple consumers, and it's all thread safe and it's all good. Um, and it's all really clean and nice. I hope that's the takeaway. It's like, it's really simple. It's really elegant. And in this example here, we're just going to wait for task that went all. We're just going to wait for these tasks to complete, which they will do once the channel is being completed. Um, then all these tasks will finish. And yeah, but actually in this case with the message queue, we'll just pull forever. So uh, unless there's an exception. So yeah, that's uh, that's that concludes the demo. Let me get back to the slides. Cool. Let me have a look at the questions and see uh, where. What's the fancy mic? It's a podcast, the pro. Me and Joe were going to start a podcast uh, a few years ago, and I think he's got the same one. We both bought it at the same time, and we just never did it. We still intend to do it. We just haven't done it. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we've had a couple of questions come through, Stuart. I don't know if you can you see them. Um, Yes. yes, we've had Philip uh, Vichek has asked, channels are essentially bringing in um, ReactiveX and has been providing us with using observables. Yes, um, it's subtly different because RX, there's a really good blog post out that I can't remember that explains all this, but um, on my slide earlier, um, the iObservable of T is kind of push-based um, and synchronous. But the whole Rx pass, like um, the whole Rx library, kind of makes those things asynchronous by having the idea of a scheduler and a I observer. And so it's it's really hard to explain, but it you do get kind of the same you you kind of get um, asynchronous streams, but not in this way, not in this really simple, elegant way. Um, there's more going on there. It's not quite the same. Cool and. Um... 
and then Ben Aurora, who I believe spoke at DDD and .NET Southwest before, has asked, uh, is there any facility in the frameworks to test channels like test scheduler in reactive extensions? Uh, I don't know how it would relate to test scheduler, but um, in terms of how you might test it, the great thing is like, um, you might decide that um, it, it, it itself is an abstraction. So um, when you do channel.create unbounded, um, that gives you a concrete implementation of the channels. But um, the, the, the base class that all these things have are all abstract. So they don't implement interfaces, but they'll have abstract base classes. Um, and you can have any implementation of those base classes. Um, but the ones out of the box are so simple they would likely be the ones that you want to use in your test. So um, I don't think this is something you want to mock out in your, your test. You might actually use this abstraction to mock out other stuff. For example, um, you might say, I don't know you do this, but you could say that um, my message bus that I use, I could have an abstraction over the top of it where I write into it using a writer and read out of it using a reader. Um, and you could actually implement your message bus using channels um, as, as the way to interface with it, but in tests, swap it out for in memory, unbounded or bounded channels. Um, so yeah, I don't know, you'd wanna mock it out. Um, it would be the thing you use to mock out, if that makes sense. Cool. Um, and uh, Duskin Gorski said, great demo, love the little rider tricks as well. And then we'll do have, um, have one more question, I think from Philip. Um, just says top rider feature over visual shoes of R sharp is cross platform. Uh, speed, I'd say. Um, I'm finding it really quick. Um, so that's it for me. It's it's just, it's fast. All the shortcuts. I you saw it there. It's just, uh, yeah, it's just the speed. I think. Perfect. Well, yes. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'll give a clap because obviously no one can. But um, yeah, thanks very much. Um, so if anyone's got any other questions, we can sort of go through them at the end. But um, we will um, move move on now. And we've got Joe Woodward um, up next, um, who's going to be giving us uh, his talk. Um, I can't find where it is now. Joe, are you there? Joe? Bear with us, we just have a few. Cool. Uh, Joe, can you hear us? Yeah, I hear you. Can you hear me? Oh yeah, you can hear me now. So I was having it. Um, Marvelous. Slot. That was lucky. I literally, I literally just lost lost my Wi-Fi then. Yeah, yeah, I was on red alert mode. Then, literally, like just as like you were about to hand over, I lost my, lost my Wi-Fi. I, oh, sure I wasn't sure if it was um, uh, a child emergency or, but um, but yeah, I try to keep a very calm face. But inside, I was having a, a, a breakdown. But yeah, glad to glad you're here. If you want to um, yeah. share share your I screen, to, okay. I was about to message you then in a panic. <clears throat> All right. Cool. Um, yeah, if you want to share your camera, and I will get my ugly mug off it, and um, I'll leave you to it. But yeah, yeah, thanks again, Stu. Um, and yeah, we are I'm off. Share my webcam. Hold on. Share my webcam. Show off your fancy, fancy microphone. Apparently, that's what um, Stu oh, was just yeah, yeah. about. Stu. <laughs> for, your, for your podcast. Yeah, Stu and I. I should do what he does and sort of keep it at the edge of the uh, the screen because it looks pretty cool. Then. <laughs> Great. I'll, I will I'll mute myself now. I'll leave you to it. Cheers. Lovely. Okay. Um, always always weird doing these online because you never get to see the people you're talking to. But uh, hello everybody. Um, tough act to follow there after Stu's talks. The slides, you know, a lot of effort into the slides, whereas mine are pretty boring. But hopefully the uh, the talk will make up for it. So we'll uh, we'll see. Um, yeah, so this this is a quick talk on the new um, feature management library by Microsoft. Um, I think it's been out for a short while now. It's sort of hit 2.0 recently. Um, they're quite interested to see what features it has over some of the alternatives. So I, I figured I'd sort of put together a couple of slides to, to go through um, in this lightning talk. Um, 
No, no. So the talk itself, um, I'll give a quick overview of why you would want to introduce feature toggling into your applications, um, just so every, everybody's sort of starting from the, the same same base. And then we'll go through the actual um, feature management library itself and some of the, the pros it has and also some of the cons, and then at the end, you know, potentially some questions. <clears throat> um, so a quick bit about me. Um, my name is Joe. Uh, I work at Just Eat. Um, if you have any questions following this or want to catch up afterwards, then feel free to hit me up on any of the uh, the channels you see on the screen there. So what uh, are feature toggles? Well, um, Martin Fowler probably has one of the, the canonical examples, uh, definitions of it. Um, feature toggles often referred to as feature flags. I'll use feature toggles and feature flags interchangeably through the, the talk. Um, are a powerful technique allowing teams to modify system behavior without changing code. Now, that's uh, the, the key port, part to, to take away from this, uh, is about modifying system behavior without changing code. And hopefully, you know, as we go through this, you'll start to see some of the benefits of being able to do that. Uh, there are lots of different types of, of feature toggles, um, lots of different types of feature toggles. Um, you've got release toggles, um, ops toggles, permission toggles, and experiment toggles. Their longevity sort of ultimately defines them. Um, there are pros and cons of, of each of them, which we'll go through shortly, but um, it's definitely worth checking out this uh, th this post from Martin Fowler where it goes into a lot of a lot of depth around sort of each toggles. Uh, ultimately, as a, as a technology, though, they're, they're quite boring. They're essentially just a, you know, a Boolean is enabled or not, um, but the patterns that they enable um, mean that they're actually quite powerful, and we'll see, see why. Um, so first of all, feature toggles and feature flags are great for being able to shape your traffic. As you start to roll out new features, you can start to send traffic to one feature, not the others. Um, so it means that you could make a deployment and in the meantime, just show that traffic to a small portion of, of users. Um, so maybe users that have opted in to canary features or beta features. So you can start to prove this, this stuff uh, faster. You know, one of the key tenants of continuous deployment, continuous integration is, um, is faster feedback and learning from that feedback. So if you have a subset of users, or at a certain time, um, if you're able to expose that that new feature to this traffic, then you can start to get that that feedback sooner. Um, you know, you can deploy these changes into staging, but ultimately staging is never as is is never production. Um, so if you can get those into production, then you know, and, and, and control those safely, then you can start to get more valuable feedback than if they exist in in, in staging. Uh, as a, a saying. That I heard that I was remembering it's called um, everybody tests in production. Some people are just more intentional about it than than others, um, which you know is, is great to highlight the fact that production is never never like staging. Um, you can make it as production like as possible, but they are two different environments. Um, on that same theme, canary deployments as well. Um, you know you can start to make these deployments where you have a single instance that has these new features enabled, um, and then if there's any issues with it. If you're seeing log errors or any kind of alerts that you're not expected to see, then you can turn that feature off. Um, you can also use it for um, aiding continuous deployment, um, trunk-based development. So um, one way I use it at work is when we start kicking off a piece of work, I'll create the very first pull request will be a, um, a new feature flag that will disable the feature I'm working on. And from that point then, I can start to deploy these changes and they'll always be behind this uh, this disabled feature flag. So ultimately that means I can have small um, short-lived branches, avoid some of the branch conflicts and merge conflicts that, that go into long feature branches, um, which kind of make continuous deployment, continuous integration quite difficult. Ultimately, it tries to, it's a way of de-risking deployments and de-risking change. <clears throat> um, they, they, they Feature toggles are just a way of enabling you to make a make a distinction between a release and a deployment. You know, when you think of a release, um, you think of a new feature, but when you think of maybe making a small change to a um, a log entry, that's kind of a deployment at that point. So it, it sounds right. You should be able to deploy um, easily and not release a feature. So you could continue to deploy these changes because the feature is off ultimately de-risking those those changes. There are some really use, interesting use cases of uh, feature toggles out there. Um, oh, I've got some questions here. Uh, I'll ask the questions at the end, uh, answer questions at the end if that's okay, so I don't get um, distracted. 
Um, one of the really interesting use cases is Facebook. They have a, uh, a feature management system called Gatekeeper, I believe it is. And when they were young, when Facebook were young, um, they got a lot of stick from TechCrunch. Uh, every single change they made, TechCrunch were tearing into them, um, giving them lots of bad press. So during a hackathon, um, some of the engineers decided to create this feature um, that would allow you to fax photos to anybody. Now I remember, like this was back in 2009. Um, but yes, yeah, so they'd be able to fax photos to, to people. And um, what they decided to do is Facebook decided to make this feature live, but only targeted a traffic uh, at TechCrunch's headquarters. So TechCrunch would go onto Facebook, they see these new features, write a post, ripping into them. In this case, they saw this new feature, um, created this blog post saying, you know, why, why do Facebook allow you to, to, to fax pictures? Nobody's going to want to use this. Everybody else sort of replying to it saying, I've no idea what you're talking about. I don't, I don't see any of it. Um, the post is still up and they've, you know, they've, they've, they've admitted that they were, they were punked. Um, so they left it there just for the, the, the lols, but it was another interesting use case of, uh, of using feature toggles and feature facts to be able to just target individual IPs. So let's have a look at the uh, the, the, the Microsoft Feature Management Library. Um, some of the key features that are worth taking away from this are it's built on the I configuration primitives. It's built on some of the I configuration primitives within the uh, configuration providers hooked into ASP.NET. Um, all the feature flags themselves are set up via um, a JSON file. Um, you can control them via Azure um, app configuration, I believe it's called, which we'll, we'll touch on shortly. Um, but ultimately, they all live in JSON files that I configure from there. Um, they use the iOptions monitoring API, so you can change those values in real time and see the change reflected on the website. It doesn't require a recompilation of the, the application. Um, you can have quite trivial, simple sort of on-off scenarios, but you can also introduce some more, more complicated dynamic ones. I have a really simple example later, which we'll go through. Um, one of the great things about it, I think, the, the things that sort of spiked my interest over some of the others is just how integrated it is into ASP.NET Core, um, which we'll go through shortly. Uh, that's not to say it has to be used with ASP.NET Core MVC. Um, you can use some of these these sort of primitives in um, other alternatives, such as Carter. Um, but yeah, it, it works sort of with routing, attributes, middleware. Um, you can do all sorts of clever branching in there. Uh, which we'll, we'll go through briefly as well. So the feature management library is developed by, um, I believe it's an Azure team. It's kind of seems to be another way to get people onto Azure, uh, which I have to be quite conscious of, I suppose. Um, so it being baked into the, using the iConfiguration APIs, um, there's an Azure configuration. So it ties quite nicely with that. So you might have difficulties trying to, use other um, services such as launch darkly which is a popular feature management or feature feature toggling um, service so you may have difficulties trying to integrate it with that there are some issues on github at the moment where people prefer some of the apis to be open so they can more easily um, toggle based on some of these other services as opposed to having to create configuration providers for all these other other services um, so keeping a close eye on that um, with feature flagging in general, though, there are some con considerations we have to, to think of. Um, you know, it's all, not all sunshine and rainbows. Failures come in all shapes and sizes. You know, feature toggles don't necessarily mean that you won't have any outages. Um, you know, we, we, as engineers, we deal with the technical side, but there's also the, you know, we're sort of heavily involved in these so-so socio-technical systems as well. So we have to con consider, you know, how people um, can can interact with these as well and possible sort of outages caused by things accidentally being left on, the wrong flag's been toggled. Um, so it's always worth considering. If you have too many feature flags and feature toggles, then this can also cause headaches. Some of the, the, the longer lived ones um, need to be sort of managed better. Um, short lived ones, uh, a, a, a bit more painless, you know, you, you make your changes, you roll them out slowly, dis then delete the, uh, the the toggle itself, make sure you clean up after yourself. Um, you also have to con consider your architecture as well and how you build your applications, ensuring that, you know, some, if your application is quite tightly coupled, then it can make feature toggling a bit more difficult than others. 
and then also when you're rolling out some of these features if you're slowly turning them on or enabling them to a small subset of traffic then you have to consider uh, monitoring visibility of, of those in comparison to the rest of the traffic so ensuring that your logs will maybe include that the the request was bucketed in a feature um, as opposed to the others and then you know how that how that works with stats coming out so things like Prometheus as well you'd have to consider um, and sort of percentile timings as well to get visibility over those requests that are part of that that feature um, but yeah I'm, I'm sure you're not here to to listen to me talk about feature toggles so uh, we'll take a look at some of the code uh, now I'm uh, I'm also using Rider here um, but we'll start off by how we add the the library so naturally along with everything else it's um it's just adding this package reference here <clears throat> um from there all we need to do um adding it is straightforward is going to configure services and then we um add it into our um the ioc container with the add feature management what i'm going to do before i forget about it is i'm also going to um add this isn't required at this point but add http context accessor uh, because I'll need that and I'll probably end up forgetting about it. <clears throat> so once this is enabled, um, that's the, I mean, you don't even need that to be fair at this point, um, but that's uh, the, the bare bones here. Um, configuration, as I said, is set in the um, app settings files. Um, so in this case here, I have a really simple feature flag, which is just an on off, a boolean, true or false. And what I'll do is, in order to utilize that feature flag, what we can do is we can either go into the controller um, and add it in the constructor. Um, so we could do this and then we can depend on the I feature manager, feature manager. Um, and then from here, you can check to see whether your feature, your feature is enabled or not. Um, but sometimes you wanna have feature toggling that's less intrusive than that. Um, so what the library also gives you is um, view uh, tag helpers, which you know can be really great for anybody doing um, MVC application that MVC development that uses Razor. Um, first and foremost, you want to make sure you add this feature management .net core um, tag helper collection there, and then from within here we could just do um, say I don't know we do feature feature name. And then we'll go back to here and we'll take this um, simple flag. And then we can go h2 hello world. Now, if I run this, here we go. So at the moment, the feature flag is off. If I go into here um, and enable this, there we go. So we're now bucketed into that feature. That feature is now enabled for us. That's a really simple on-off example. If you're doing kind of trunk-based development, you might want to start with that. But eventually, you'll probably want to start to move on to some more um, some more complicated boxing. So you might want to create your own your own feature um, filter for this. Um, so in typical Blue Peter fashion, I have this custom feature filter that I've I prepared earlier, <laughs> and you can create your own feature toggles by um, implementing this i feature filter um, as you see i'm then using the ihp context accessor to be able to um, access uh, the query string if i go back into here make sure i've enabled that and then if we go back to here uh, so you'll see in this this example all i'm doing here on this evaluate async when it evaluates a feature is I'm checking the query strings to see whether the word enabled exists. Uh, if it does, then I'll return true from that. You can load in um, configuration from here. So for instance, I could load this configuration here for enabled. Um, I can do that via um, just accessing the parameters here, parameters get section, and then I'll be able to read those out of there. But in this case, uh, just a simple enabled will, will, will suffice. So if I now go and run this, first before i do that though i need to add this as a filter as a custom filter so if i had to go add feature filter and then it's called custom feature filters there we go and now if i run this let's stick a breakpoint in here <clears throat> oh 
Oh, I realise what I've done there. Hold on. Feature filter. So I've got to go and take my feature name. So the nice thing about this is the, 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 the fact that the names are decoupled from the filters themselves. So the names don't have to change as you start to add and change filters or create or extend those filters. Um, but it does mean that when you're doing a demo, you've got to remember to go and actually change the, the filter name. <coughs> There we go. So now this should hopefully load. Features not there. If I go to enabled, there we go. As if by magic, we're now sort of bucketed in there. Now, the library itself comes with a couple of filters um, out of the box. I think there's, um, oh, what is it? There's timing filters. Um, oh, what were they? I can't remember. There's Percentage, that's it. So you can choose a percentage of traffic that will see the filter and then also um, time boxing them as well. So um, you could maybe enable a feature flag at certain times of the day, maybe when traffic is lowest or when people don't make as many orders. Um, and then also based on 10% sort of, of traffic. So you could slowly roll out these changes and monitor for any, you know, any uh, unforeseen side effects. Um, I mentioned how it's quite tightly integrated into ASP.NET Core. Um, some of the other extension APIs you've got here is um, there's a feature feature gate attribute where you specify your feature, your, your sort of feature name there. Um, you can do that on both the controller itself um, and then also on the um, on the controller actions. I think all that does is that will just hit an MV, uh, MVC filter that will then return a 404 if it doesn't find find those. Um, but more impressively, or more interestingly, is it can start to be tied into the whole um, app builder side of things. So you can also do um, app dot um, feature, use for feature, and then um, use feature uh, middleware for feature which means that you can start to create branch and log logic within your application pipeline to be, to be able to go off and you know hit a whole different host of apis as opposed to just controllers or load in certain middleware that um load in certain middleware for people that are, are bucketed within the the feature um in addition to that you've also got um mvc filters you can use um that you can start to apply across the board like global filters and things like that um but yeah i mean the the, the key sort of the key interesting parts to take away in my opinion is these custom filters so that means that you can start to create kind of constructs that your teams might use to be able to um access filters so you know only in certain environments enable filters or uh, features um or only for people with certain browsers or certain cookies um ultimately just giving you a lot more control over you know who who sees these uh, these new features. Um, that's it on the demo front. Um, I definitely recommend checking it out if it's something you're interested in. Um, what have we got? I'll go back to the slides. No presenter with you that can go away. Uh, as I mentioned, it, it's driven by the iConfiguration provider. So if you do want to try and integrate it with any other services like AWS, and you'll have to look at a configuration provider for for that as i said there are currently issues open at the moment where people are asking for some of those apis to be extended or made public so that they can um so that they can they can easily integrate with other services and some people are saying well you know e even better than just doing that you know let's just add the ability to to enable features via other means as opposed to the iConfiguration providers so we'll see see what happens there as i said it's sort of quite azure focus being developed by the azure team so you know, we'll see how they take community contributions around some of those, but only time will tell. Um, that's it pretty much for this. Um, if you're interested in more, then definitely check out the GitHub page here. Um, as I said, I definitely recommend the Martin Fowler resources on feature toggles as well. It goes into a, a lot more sort of comprehensive um, use cases for them. Um, and then also there's a, a great um, blog post by Andrew Locke, which kind of goes over uh, some of the features enabled in the earlier versions, which I would, I would check out. And that's it. And cool. That's um, perfect. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, we, we have a question from Jamie Reese. Um, so is there any single page application libraries that fit in 
uh, so fit in with the library, for example, if we want to feature toggle something, but also want our Angular app to hide a page without calling it an API to work out the feature is enabled. Oh, that's a good question. I don't know whether there is. Um, I've not seen anything. Uh, I think in this case, you would have to hit some kind of API to be able to, to get that information, I'm afraid. Um, or alternatively, when rendering the initial page, including whether those features are enabled or disabled in some kind of JSON object that's output to, to the page. You could probably do something along those lines or, yeah. Yeah, I've not seen anything for Spa. You might have to be quite quite creative with that, I'm afraid. Um, can we have um, Mikhail um, Giagaras um, ask, what percentage of your deployments would you estimate you put behind a feature flag? Um, personally, every change that I make before it's ready to turn on and actually run um, in production, I put behind a flag or... I've, I've sort of started to encourage them behind a flag as well within the team. So as soon as we start working on a new feature, feature for the, the very first pull request is um, the, the the core code of the feature flag disabled, um, and then you know we'll start to deploy that to production and then follow up with changes as as we go through, and then also be able to ensure that we can override that with say cookies that will automatically bucket us into those changes, um, so we can test them. In production ourselves but not have uh, uh, visitors or other other people kind of seeing those those changes and then once that's at a hundred percent once that traffic is at a hundred percent then we'll remove that that feature flag and that's kind of where it's important to ensure that those feature flags are uh, sort of unintrusive as, as possible within your code base so you don't have to make these large sweeping changes to, to pull those out afterwards um, but you know that's that saved our bacon a couple of times where we might have wanted to disable something. So instead of having to roll back an instance, we can turn something off. And we use a service called Optimizely a lot for our feature toggling. So I'm quite keen to try and tie this into Optimizely. So we've got this consistent API over these feature toggling, make use of all these benefits um, as to how tightly integrated it is into the MVC framework, um, whilst also having our own sort of our own feature toggling. Um, um, sort of switches behind that will either be some of our own experiment services or optimizely, for instance. So generally, like yeah, generally most of them, most certainly both most big changes, we want to make sure we we can, you know, we can disable when we need to or if we need to. Perfect. And um, especially with our core components and these changes, you know, we don't want to, you know, we don't like being woken up and having to roll roll things back. It'd be much better if we could just turn them off. Cool. Um, Matt Lacey has asked, can you use the feature management outside of ASP.NET? Yeah, so you can use it in console applications. Um, there are two separate libraries there. Um, there's the Microsoft.FeatureManagement and the Microsoft.FeatureManagement.ASP.NET Core. Um, so you can actually use them in console applications as well. Cool. Um, and I said, uh, very own Jason Haffey has asked, uh, said, I just uh, had a look through the GitHub and did not see anything um, about having a backstore SQL uh, option. Uh, do you know this uh, option is available yet? I don't. What you've got to consider is the fact that it is driven via the configuration provider. So what you want to do is have a look, see if there's any kind of SQL configuration provider, um, because it, it basically just leans on those primitives within um, ASP.NET. So that's where you want to go, really, as opposed to feature management dot SQL or other options within the feature feature management is look for those configuration providers. Otherwise, you'd have to build one yourself, which you can't do. Like you can create your own configuration providers. Um, Richard Howes has asked, uh, can it be enabled on, say, a user cookie? Uh, might I use it for A/B testing? Yes, yeah, it can do. It also has session, um, sort of persistent ses sessions as well, and consistent bucketing. So it can be used for that as well. I think that's one of the uh, the things they recommend in the uh, in, in the docs as well as how it can be used for that. Cool. Um, Julian, uh, so a few more questions. Julian Berry's asked. It feels like it's running with scissors. Um, what is feature toggling a bad fit? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I don't know. I mean, you hear naturally nothing's a you know nothing's a it's all trade offs, isn't it? Um, I don't know, bad fit. You, you know, there, there are a lot of large companies, extremely large companies doing these kind of things. I think that they get 
challenging when they're at scale, which is kind of why you've got to be important. You've got to be disciplined in ensuring you remove those feature flags and try and keep your feature flag count down. As you start to have feature flags that enable feature flags, say you have more longer lived feature flags, then you know, that can that can become a nightmare, uh, and there's uh, you start to lose confidence in in making those changes on enabling them, disabling them because you don't know if there's some that are relying on others. So I think the longer lived, the more of them you have, the longer they live, it starts to become quite troublesome. Um, there's probably some others outside of that that I'm not aware of, but that's certainly the ones that that come to mind. Cool. Wagner um, uh, Ramos has asked, can we reroute to a different endpoint? Yes, you can. Yeah. Um, I, that's one of the, the, the powerful things of being able to use um, the either custom filters or some of the um, the MVC filters as well as you could do that. Uh, um, Craig Broadman asks, are you able to feature toggle upgrades to libraries? Um, so new good packages. Oh. Upgrades. You could feature toggle middleware. So if there's a library that you add via middleware, then you can feature toggle that. Um, but then if you're trying to run two of those side by side, then that would be tricky. But you, you know, say you add a new a new library, you could feature toggle on that new library if it kind of fits within middleware. Um, yeah. But upgrade and packages. Yeah, running side by side. I I, I don't know about that. Um, perfect. We've got a couple uh, questions now. Then so Mikhail's uh, another question said. Uh, would you say this currently not usable in AWS? I don't know. Um, as I mentioned, it does out of the box. Well, it's not out of the box really, but it it does lean on the i configuration provider. So I don't know if there's any Microsoft like i configuration providers for um, AWS. It wouldn't surprise me if there was some somewhere. Um, as long as you've got those, then yeah, it should. It should work. I, I can't imagine. You know, I imagine somebody's created a configuration provider for AWS, so it should, it should, it should be there. Um, as again, you've got to you've got to go and look for those configuration providers as opposed to looking at the feature toggle because they are two very separate things. So yeah, I'm just looking at one now. It does look like there's some options there to be able to um, use some AWS things. Cool. And um, yeah, we'll do the last question now. So um, Manjane for sure has asked, um, can you use this feature in ASP.NET Web API too? Yes, you can do because it's using. Um, it, there are two packages. There's the ASP.NET Core one, um, and then there's the Microsoft Feature Management, which you should be able to do. I haven't done any sort of full ASP.NET stuff in a in a while, but the package name would certainly imply that you can do. Um, you may need to include some of the the. Yeah, some of the, some of the um, the more .NET Core things, such as the I configuration providers, um, and use those instead. Uh, but it looks like you can do yes. But yeah, you um, have to think about how you try and seed those, cool. get that data into the configuration management. And um, we've had a couple of more questions come in, if you don't mind, Joe. Um, if not, we can get them sent across, um, sent sent across at another time. It's up to you, Nick. I appreciate his uh, getting on late. No, no, like Dustin, yeah, yeah, cheers for that, Dustin. Um, yeah, he's just said um, loading two versions of the same library into the same app context. Yeah, that's it. Um, you know, if you're trying to load, load two, um, two different versions of the same library, then you wouldn't be able to do that. So cheers for clarifying that. Um, that was to address the earlier question as to whether you could roll out new get package updates. Yeah, and um, Tim Spate is, uh, says, "Ask us what assumes you can feature toggle middleware in respects of logging to only do overnight logs. Um, what other uses have you used switching stuff off in the pipeline? What other use have you used switching stuff off in the pipeline? Um, I haven't really done anything switching stuff off in the pipeline. It's generally just been rolling new features out. Um, so when adding new." You know, new features to an application or API. It's more around that as to pipeline behaviors. Um, so I wouldn't really be able to give any key examples of doing anything within within pipelines, I'm afraid. But yeah, you know, you could um, do things like overnight logs and, and enable to see some of that stuff within within the pipeline. Cool. Uh, and then we'll do the last question then from Jim Rees. Um, are there any global Azure services that allow us to uh, control features from multiple deployments? 
I don't know. Um, I'm not a big Azure user. I'm more sort of AWS myself. Um, I know they've got the app configuration, so I don't know how that works with multiple deployments. Um, I suppose you'd have to, yeah, I don't know how that would work off the top of my head. I don't know how, I, I presume the app configuration is key value pairs, so you may need to end up checking those, bake those into the keys or something, potentially, I, I don't know how that would work, but yeah, sorry, I can't, I can't answer that any better than that, I'm afraid. All right, um, but no, it's so thank you very much, Joe. I'll continue the like, uh, round of applause to everyone else. I'm sure you would if you were doing it, if you were doing it virtually. But um, yeah, I just wanted to say, yeah, but um, I just want to say thank you, Robin, uh, Stu, and Joe. Um, generally, the, the numbers have been sort of great, Stephen. I think, obviously, with everything going on at the moment in terms of um, in the world, um, hopefully, these sort of meetups, virtual events, and not just I doing, but everyone else within the development community uh, can keep people best connected. Um, but yeah, keep an eye on the IO website. We've got, we'll keep on doing these for as long as, um, as long as we're in lockdown. But yeah, thank you very much again. Um, there is a survey at the end if anyone wants to sort of stay and fill it out. But, um, but yeah, thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank just feel free to drop, uh, drop us an email and then we can, and um, we can ask them to the relevant person. Thanks for speakers and um, thanks everyone who attended too. Perfect. Cool. Thank you very much, everyone. We will close it off now. I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for organising. Thank you. Cheers, mate. Bye.